manager of journal and engineering to please come on stage thank you thank you hi uh, good afternoon salam alaikum uh, it's a great pleasure to to be here at nebra office to share uh, to come and share our view on the evolving uh, energy market uh, transformation and to discuss, uh, to share with you uh, the role of uh, gas in this new energy market. So, yeah, my name is Otman Benamar. I've been with GE for 23 years, partially in France, and the last seven years in uh, Dubai, based in Dubai. I'm the general manager for engineering, covering Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. So. Uh, when, when I started my career, like 23 years ago, uh, to be honest, I, at that time what we were worrying about is the fuel supply. Will there be fuel for our gas turbine? We were not thinking about the challenges that we are seeing today. It was, yeah, by 2015 some people were thinking that we will hit the top of the gas fuel and it will be the decline of gas fuel. But every day, today, we are hearing new discoveries, making the fuel more available, more affordable. And with the introduction of renewable, this is really contributing to the change of the energy market. Uh, who's changing the pages? OK, so just go next. So I, I, I've been here for the different uh, presentations, so I'll try to not be to not repeat as much as I can, but uh, we see, uh, so when everything started in terms of renewable by governments, you know, subsidizing the renewable energy for decarbonization objectives and to come to, to try to match the objectives in terms of temperature rise at the globe level and to hold it between 1.5 and 2 degrees C. So there was a huge push, subsidies that created a market and also it has created a supply chain and today we see very competitive prices on the renewable but this is not a, this is the global picture now when you zoom in every country is very specific the US has its own specificity Europe has its own specificity and uh, Pakistan is same so in addition to the decarbonization objectives one of the first things actually is the security, the supply security. Make sure that you can deliver power to the consumers, you can develop the industry, and uh, this is where we see a lot of diversification in terms of uh, fuel, in terms of source of en energy in addition to what we all the renewable. Uh, I've never personally, I've been working with the region for more than 15 years, and I would have never imagined that we will see a coal plant in Dubai. So this is happening. Uh, same thing in Abu Dhabi, nuclear. This is uh, being uh, commissioned right now and uh, five gigawatts of nuclear coming up. So it's not only looking at decarbonization, it's looking at security and Pakistan has its own priorities. And uh, some of the countries, they have indigenous fuels they, they want to use. So it's, it's not one solution fits all, but there is a debate to have to make sure that how we can address these uh, new challenges. So here you have the main ways of, that are driving this transformation. So the first one is distributed power and central generation. We are seeing more distributed power, but driven by different aspects in, in developing countries. This will be to, to, to create, to bring power in remote area and in, in a developed country, it will be more to make the grid more resilient to the renewable. Uh, but definitely the, the, the centralized generation is still there because it's bringing value in terms of efficiency, but we will see later it's also bringing value in terms of flexibility with the latest technology. We see, as I said, a strong growth in renewable, wind, solar, but actually our view is that we will not achieve the goals that are set for renewable without bringing a solution to address the intermittency. Whether it's storage, which we see in the next bucket, or gas, uh, gas uh, generation. Uh, by by, by uh, design, those resources are not available all the time. 
And we will, we will see that you need to have thermal or other storage solution to increase, to go to like 30, 50% of the generation being a renewable. Uh, battery storage is a pretty good solution. It's, we saw a decline in the prices of the battery storage, but it's, it's a good solution for intraday intermittency, but it's not a good solution, even though the price, there is no price to make it a good solution from, for day to day or week to week or even intra season. I've seen some numbers for it, just for example, if we take the example of Tokyo, if you want to make Tokyo having backup with batteries, if they have like a four day storm, if, if they have backup, they would need the whole world batteries to have that backup solution based on battery. So this shows you that battery is solution for ancillary services, maybe for peak during the day, peak shifting, but it's not a good solution for intra-season, intra-day uh, uh, storage. Uh, electrical vehicle, and I would add to it in more general a lot of transformation in the energy because when we set a decarbonization objective, it's not only we focus a lot on the power, but there is also other sectors that generate carbon oxides, and among them, of course, transportation. So that in the coming years, electrical vehicle will create additional demand of power but we don't see it as substantial to disrupt the plans that we have for the power generation. Maybe over 20, 30 years, maybe we will see a more impact. But in the short term, let's say we're talking 10 years, we will not see a complete, uh, you know, a big addition of power generation due to electrical vehicle. And it's unequal uh, from country to country. Maybe in developing economies, it will have a higher impact, but in other emerging markets or developing uh, the uh, economy, it will be slower and it will not really impact the, 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 the generation size. Uh, digital, we talked about it, uh, there was discussion about it in previous uh, presentation. It's key for managing all these uh, uh, diversification of power generation and uh, uh, challenges of the intermittence. Uh, digitalization brings you prediction, so which is key when you are doing renewable. You don't have to get surprised by a change in weather, which affects your generation. You can plan for it properly, and it can, can help you really managing the most optimized generation assets uh, across the day and across the year. So definitely digital is important in, in this transformation. Uh, so how, how the future looks, so as I said, every country is unique, but it will be a combination of these different things, right? So wind and solar dramatically, uh, the cost of electricity dramatically uh, reduced over the years. Somebody this morning talked comparison between 2013 and uh, t today, and every day, and especially maybe in the Gulf region, every time there is a tender, we see a new lowest. So just recently, uh, to be honest, well, I was not really expecting. There was a tender in Qatar with the embargo and everything. We were thinking that they would not be able to achieve a, another lowest dollar per, per kilowatt hour. So they tendered 18, 800 megawatt, and actually they came, came with the lowest globally at 1.54 cents per kilowatt hour. So, and the wind is also achieving very low cost of electricity is down to about three, four. In some region with high exposure to wind, uh, Morocco, for example, they, I was talking to some developer, they said it can go down to even two cents per kilowatt hour. So very competitive, uh, renewable. So, and as I said before, so the, the fastest way to, to, uh, to achieve the decarbonization objectives will still remain the gas, because it's a half of the coal emissions, for example, and it also brings the flexibility that you need to increase your renewable. You have fast ramping, all the aspects that you need, and we will talk about it later. So you need gas to stabilize your grid. Uh, storage and hybrid solution combining a renewable and a thermal solution. Uh, and the grid, the grid is important. It was presented in the previous presentation as well. Uh, you need to make sure that you can 
uh, transport the electricity from the different location where you have renewable thermal and make sure you have the most optimiz optimized power to your customers. And the, the digital as an enabler to tie in all this solution together. And if you see at this, we will end up with maybe a new model. And again, every country may have its own new model. Uh, how the PPAs will be working in this context uh, when, when the gas will be there running less. So these are questions that are interesting to address ahead of the changes. Uh, he, this is a, a global outlook. It's not specific to Pakistan, but we see a, a, a growth, a consistent growth of 2.2% in the power sector. Uh, but we see still that 60% over the next 10 years will be still gas. And uh, so, but uh, of course, the highest increase, we will see it on the renewable side. But in the emerging market, those numbers, so the emerging markets are the one driving this increase, 85%. So the other countries are replacement of ex uh, retiring power plants and so on. So gas is, as you can see, it still has a role over the 10 years, uh, and I, I'll explain a little bit more uh, on this later. I think you all know this. I don't know, need to go through. It was presented this morning. So, so, so gas is, is important for all reasons. So one, one thing is the fuel supply I talked about. So what's happening is that we have abundant gas all over the world. So more than 20 countries have liquidification capacities. And actually, just reading the news in the last days, and there is more and more discoveries. UAE just announced 80 trillion cubic feet of gas. UAE didn't announce any discovery for the last. As long as I've been in the UAE, I have not seen any new discoveries, and Abu Dhabi reserves were going down, and all of a sudden we have this announcement of 80 trillion. So this is a major change. I don't know how they will handle this in the context of the diversification that they planned when you have now gas available in front of your shores, and it seems it's shallow, quite shallow gas, easy to extract. So the other country, Saudi, just last week, they announced the Jafura uh, field, gas field. This is 200 trillion cubic feet. It's massive, and they are investing to develop that field. So Egypt already announced uh, Lebanon has, has gas. So it's, there is abundant gas, abund and the increasing uh, uh, liquefaction uh, uh, capacities, especially in the US, we all saw how the US, be, from an important, become an exporter uh, of gas through Henry Hub. Uh, and uh, now they are playing a major role in the gas field. And in parallel, you see that a lot of countries are adopting LNG, and I think there's no need to explain too much. You are one of those countries. Uh, you have already two terminals of LNG, and I understand there are two more additional to come. Uh, but all, all around the world, countries are adopting LNG, and even in the Gulf. Bahrain is building their terminal. Kuwait built their terminal. So. It's everybody is considering gas as the fuel source that they need to have dependable capacity, flexible capacity, and to come together with the renewable introduction. What gas can bring you? Uh, I, I, you had the example, of course. It's, it's among the lowest dollar per kilowatt in terms of installation. In terms of schedule as well, in terms of project, how fast you can bring the project, materialize the project. Within three years, you have a combined cycle of 1,200 megawatt roughly. And uh, you have also lower, I talked about it previously, lower CO2 emission compared to coal. And at flexibility, uh, so you had fast and reliable starts. Uh, you can, we can achieve with the HA less than 30 minutes uh, start uh, uh, in a fast start configuration. We have the base load efficiency, of course, the world leading record in efficiency. We have the fast ramping and uh, lo uh, part loading operation. We can go up to 100 uh, uh, mega economical. You can part load the plant around maybe 20%, 30% in emission compliant. 
and still be ready with those uh, quite impressive loading ramps, bring power up if the, your renewable goes, uh, the wind stop blowing and the uh, uh, sun sh stop shining. It's the uh, so, so, uh, so the So gas has been driving, for example, in the case of U.S., uh, they dropped their uh, CO2 emission by 20, 70 percent. 60 percent of that is driven by the retirement of coal plants and building a new gas generation asset. Flexibility, dependable capacity and abundant as, uh, gas uh, sources and I, uh, in some cases we saw the need in urban area to have power stations so it has also a lowest footprint uh, for uh, per megawatt. So just quickly, uh, I have only three minutes, but I wanted to, to, to I just read a quite interesting study uh, done in the US because one of their grid, so of course California and New York, they have very strict uh, objective in terms of decarbonization, but they are only contributing by 3.2% into the CO2 of the U.S. So the major uh, networks uh, or grids that are developing are in the mid-continent, what we call, so among of them PGM, which is Maryland and uh, New Jersey. So these guys, they, they did two scenarios before two, 2040, uh, I, one scenario is what we call status quo, where they would drop the emissions from power generation by 50%, and uh, they have a deep decarbonization scenario, which is dropping the, uh, the emissions by 95% of CO2. So the interesting thing is that in both scenarios, the gas had a play. So what changed? So And even on the lowest uh, status quo uh, case, while dropping the emission by 50%, actually they increase the gas installed capacity. What change is how, you, how much you use the gas, but you still need it. You may even need to add it, but what will change is the capacity factor and how you do number of starts. That's what will change, but the gas is still in both scenario, even though you drop your emission by 95%. So it's a must for a future uh, the objective of decarbonization, it's a must to have the gas there. So just in terms of what's, what's available there, so I will not talk about the products in details, it's not the objective of the session, it was just to share what we see on the role of the gas. So you experienced here, it's not a, it has not been recognized by Guinness record, but uh, Havali is the highest efficiency in the world. Uh, the one that was recognized by, uh, because they just have to do the process. The one that has been recognized is uh, Bouchard in France at 62.2% and uh, Nishinagoya in Japan for 60 hertz at 63.08% gross. But uh, so, and we're looking today, we're offering technologies that can achieve 64 and we're looking by using improved aerodynamics new combustion systems and materials for the thermal barrier will allow us to go higher in temperature. We're looking at achieving something between 65 and 70 percent. This was out of reach like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but in a short time we managed to go to a new era of efficiency. But we're bringing this efficiency with flexibility, as I said, start up less than 30 minutes, 80, 100 megawatt per minute for ramping. And today, the H fleet globally is, uh, is more than 100 units and uh, 500,000 operating hours. Uh, so these are the world records. Quickly, uh, to finish, uh, it's hydrogen. There's a lot of discussion around the role of hydrogen. We talked about storage, so battery is one solution. Steps, what we call steps, is, you know, taking water from here to store it and use it after, it's another. And hydrogen is the new thing that people are thinking about, and especially what we call the green hydrogen, hydrogen that you create from renewable through electrolysis, and then you store it or use it in transport, or you store it to use it energy when you need it. So the, today, the, most of the hydrogen is coming through what we call steam reforming, steam methane reforming. This is a process that uh, makes a lot of quantities of hydrogen. Unfortunately, it generates CO2, and you have to manage the CO2 through a sequestration. So it's not really a viable and not real green solution unless you develop the whole chain until sequestration. 
So the other solution is, the, as I said, the electrolysis. And the problem with this solution today is its efficiency and it's very intensive in water. So it may not be fit for everybody. So, and uh, we did some analysis like with, to have one megawatt gas turbine hydrogen, you would need up to four or five megawatt renewable. So there is a lot to be done there. Uh, personal, it's uh, just a personal view. I don't, we may see some pilot at 100% hydrogen. So a lot of people talk about what is your capability. Uh, our capability, we, we already have units running at 95% hydrogen. For example, in Korea uh, and uh, in Spain, about uh, 30 or 50 percent. Uh, we have that capability. Even our age has been developed, actually, this combustion system has been developed for hydrogen, and we can burn up to 50, 60 percent. But I think in terms of economic viability and how you want to use hydrogen, it will be more a blend. Uh, you would inject when you have excess of renewable, you would generate hydrogen, and you would inject it into your gas network to make a, a system more efficient, like greener in terms of CO2. But 100% is definitely a future that we can wish. But today, in the economic, economic viability of the solution, it's not yet there. I'm almost on time. Okay, and there's no music to stop me, or like the Oscars. Uh, questions? Yeah. Please, sorry I had to be fast. Any question? Our, our, our gas turbine for uh, the, the solution that we have in Korea has been running for 20 years. So it's, that's a standard combustion. We're working on improving the, 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 the other type of combustion. So for, for example, if you are going for blending, if you blend the less than 5%, so uh, the natural gas, it's unlikely we will change anything in the com gas turbine. It becomes a must to change when you go beyond that blending because the, the hydrogen come with challenges. It's a, it's a high energy in mass, but uh, two times 2.5 percent, that's next. But today I can go up to 50, 60 percent. Yes? Let me see if I understand. So what, what's changing the load profile? That's the question. The question is, is that the load of the air power plant will be changed in the future? Yes, the load. Yeah. Yeah, there will be more engineers that will produce that problem to create an effective But my understanding is that the engineers are actually producing less carbon right? Yes, they are, they are reducing, producing less carbon than coal. For example, 50 percent less. Yes. That's because of renewable. So, so as long as renewable, so we're adding a lot of renewable into the grid. So, you need. So, I, I distinguish between capacity installed and how much how much time you use your gas assets, right? So, because renewable are increasing. They will take most of the time of the production, right? But you need to have gas to make sure that every time your wind is not blowing, you will be using the gas acid. So you will be using them less. You need them to start more, start and stop. But you need them to be there. I hope this answered the question.
Yeah. So what we do, I'm, I'm not the, the expert on gas, right? But I participate to those discussions. Two days, we're talking about six, seven dollars, I think, in the market. Uh, at Hanria, by, I understood that it's going down to two dollars. We, I think, we don't see the gas going high where it was before, like it went up to 10, 12, even 16 in Japan. We think we will be in the range between two and five. So, yeah, gas price will not be uh, high uh, for, for a while. We'll... Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ottman. Now our next and last speaker is Mr. Javed Akhtar, member of Power Wapta, who would present the factual position of Hydropower potential in Indus casket. Please welcome. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Chairman Nepra, members Nepra, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great privilege for me to extend my gratitude and congratulate Nepra for arranging such a marvelous event for the technical people to share their views with each other and so that we can address our future problem in appropriate manner. I'm not going to take much of your time because Chairman Wabla has already explained a lot of things. What I will do, I will take one slide from the existing stations which is producing energy at the moment. Could you please go to slide number two? Well, these are all the stations at one time. If I am just giving, just to quote one example of Tarvela, you see the first 14 machines that were installed from 1977 up to 1994. So now you can imagine how much useful life they have outlived after now. And still those stations are generating according more than their capacity because those uh, technical experts which deal with the hydro, the hydro have more 15% overloading can be taken on hydro machines. So these are those stations we are now carrying out refurbishment of Mangla refurbishment project due to Mangla dam raising because there is increase of about 40 feet head. You know, because in hydro generation or in hydro machines, you have two variables. Either you have to increase the Q, discharge, or you have to increase the head. So that's why the Mangla, the, the installed capacity of Mangla at the moment is 1000 megawatt. But that will be increased up to 1310 megawatt. And the total cost of the project is 52 billion. First, for the, the contract for the first six units have already been awarded. The first two units are in refurbishment and upgradation. Could you please move to slide number seven? Directly slide number seven because people are exhausted now. Just the next one. Next. No. Go, go. You see, the Indus cascade. Just move to the Indus cascade. The graph is there. It's at the end, I think. It's at nine slides of seven. You see, now we are talking about the development project, but I haven't heard anything that how we will evacuate the power. If you look at the Indus cascade, and you just take it from Takot up to Shayok, so you will see that there is limited flexibility available for the transmission corridor. My friends, there is a lot of hydro potential in Pakistan. Pakistan is rich in hydro potential, which is available in abundance in northern part of the country that have a limited flexibility for the transmission line. So we have to think about the we have to think about the evacuation of power also. We will develop the projects after this one that is coming. 
The slide is after this one, my friend. No, not this one. Actually, maybe there is something. You see, if you take it from Shayok up to Takot, it's about 29,000 megawatt capacity. But do you have that capacity that you can evacuate that power from Shayok up to? Because we need the power in the town district of Pakistan. So that's why once we think about a development project, we must think about a evacuation. And you see, we have two routes. One is along with the KKH, which is a strategic route, a single communication road between northern part of the country, between northern part with the rest of the country. And we have the other evacuation route, that is the Babusar Top. You see, so that's why, because uh, when I was in Nepra, uh, I think that was in December somewhere, I requested to Nepra that we need to have deliberation on the transmission also. We will discuss, we will give you the development project, but we need to have some strategy about the evacuation of that power. If we are going to complete a project like that, that's who is coming on. And after that, the Amir Basha will be coming. But we must devise a methodology and strategy from now onward to have that. You see, what will happen? If we are going to construct the Amir Basha, we will have another storage project. Okay. We will, have, we will store some water there. That's good even for Sarbela. Because the silt will be stopped there. And it will enhance and increase the life of Sarbela. We will do regulation in, from two different dams. One regulation from the Amir Basha and one regulation from uh, this Tarbela. Now, in, in the lean water period, the Tarbela is generating 500 megawatt. But once there is regulation from the Amir Basha, we will raise the generation from 500 to 1500 and 2000 megawatt. You see? So that's why those projects which are coming in the Indus cascade, that will increase the life of the existing stations, that will provide us an opportunity you see, what is the big problem in the dam construction, the displacement, the settlement, the resettlement? We are not addressing that problem. Once, you see, we need to have strategies, planning for each and every one activity. Otherwise, we won't succeed in that. This is a forum I'm just giving, because always when I, I'm talking somewhere on the Energy Summit, so my friends, we need to devise a strategy, a planning. Transmission line must be there. We must have some ideas for the resettlement. We must have some ideas for the social uh, resettlement of the social works in that area. You see, so these are the things. So my friends, uh, if let me give you an argument by, sta by starting from the mountain of this country, which is a great asset that nature has bestowed on this country. That is the major contribution uh, contributor. There is plenty of resources, but we need to utilize it. This is our duty. That's why you are the think tanks of this country. We have uh, expatriate also. So we have to devise and work on these strategies in tandem, in parallel. Otherwise, if we go for the development pro projects and we don't have the evacuation strategy, my friend, we will be in trouble. So that's why this is my humble request to this forum. It's a very really, uh, again I appreciate and congratulate this uh, NEPRA being a regulated body, but they have done a very marvelous effort by providing an opportunity to the technical people to share ideas and views and their things with each other. This is a very good forum that we are talking to each other. But the thing is, we are Pakistani. We must think as a Pakistani. And for that, what we will do, how we will do, that is, what you have in your pocket, you just come out with that. What is in my pocket, I will share that with you. So this is the problem. The Indus cascade is full of hydro potential. That will give you about more than 29,000. You see, if you look at the previous design and the previous feasibility and the new feasibility, like I'm giving you the example of Tarbella 4. It was conceived for 960 megawatt, but the plant has been installed for uh, 1,410 megawatt. So that's why what we have conceived in the past, that is going to be increased. But that increase will be beneficial, will be fruitful in that scenario once we have the strategies, planning for each and every activity on time. If I'm going to plan the development project now, 
and I will, I'm going to plan for the ev power evacuation five years later. What will happen if the project is going to be unbarred and commissioned? That's why I'm requesting, again, uh, from here to the chairman NEPRA and to the NEPRA members, that they must think we need to have a session, especially that the NTDC, that is a very competent department, that they must share their views with us. What are they doing? What is their planning? Because you need, it's not only these projects which are visible, it's not only that much capacity which is identified. Maybe if there is an increase in that, what we will do? So that's why we must address this problem also that the identified power, that is there, but we must have some cushion in that for the future powers, you see. So that's why up to Takot, Takot even was identified for 2,400. Now it is 400. 4,866, 4, you can see that the previous planning, the previous thinking, the previous vision, that was only for 2,400, and now it's 4,800. You see, that is the main reason. We, being a Pakistani, we need collective efforts. We should not run in the divergent direction. We must bring our collective things, things, thinking to a convergent point so that we can come because this is a country which is giving us each and everything. My kids and my family is giving prestige and honor in this country. Otherwise, if I'm there, going to shift it to another, I will not get that much honor there, you see. So being a Pakistani, this is my, because he didn't show me that is, but I just give you a rough idea from Takot, uh, Patan, Dasu, Damir Basha, Bunji, Skardu, Yalbu, Tangas, and Shayok, these are the plants which are coming in the cascade. That is helping you, you see, each plant is coming up to the next. What will happen? That will arrest the salt here, the deposit here, the clean water will go to the next, it will enhance the life up there, you see. So my friends, we should not be worried. Uh, we have plenty of potentials and I'm, I'm really uh, very happy that uh, Lepra has arranged this thinking and I will request them to arrange again and again to go for such thing so that we should have a collective strategy for the development as well as for power evacuation plan. Otherwise, either if we just go for the... If there is no transmission line, like what happened in Neelam Jalam, there was some problem, you might, might be aware of that. We can afford here, but we can't afford that in the, that narrow valley. You have only two corridors, either along the KKH or you can go through the Babu Sar top. So I think with these words, because the people are <laughs> tired now, these were the few words I was supposed to explain my map, but he couldn't bring it out there. But I can again, Takur, Pachan, Dasu, Shayo, Damir Basha, Bonji, Skardu, Yalbu, Tangas, and Shayok. These were the few uh, identified hydropower projects on the end, and if you have any questions, I am ready to respond to that. Thank you. See, uh, my friend, we are talking about hydro projects and endless cascade. So those are the big projects. If there is a small project coming on the uh, tributary of Indus, you can't even accommodate that in that area. You see, the population is scattered. That's in the hilly area, like the Khan Fault. It's a 72 megawatt project, but still we have a line. The power is coming here, you see. So that's why in Galgal Pakistan, what did they do? What, uh, when they install a small station, they have a local distribution system there, but we are talking of 1,000 megawatts. So when we are talking of 1,000 megawatts, 
so that can't be uh, spent and consumed there in that area. That is a run up river plant and canal. You are talking about canal, I am talking about river. So there must be difference between river, uh, canal and river. You see, that's my question. You see, they are determined. The, wet, the water going in the Indus from that Devsai plain to India. If we arrange a tunnel from now, the water they have stopped from us is more than that. That's why we are planning to divert that first tributary, which is entering the uh, Indian Hill Kashmir and then uh, coming in the uh, Indus River. It's, we are planning that if uh, for that one, it's in planning and I think it's going to, when it's going to be execution, but it's already planned. We will divert water from here to Satpara and that will be directly connecting from Satpara, it will go out to the Indus River. So I think, uh, don't worry, Indus is ours. Nobody can snatch that from us, <laughs> you see. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Javed Akhtar. And uh, I would like to reiterate the fact that there are designated days for transmission, innovation, generation, and distribution. So uh, I would also request you to please participate in that as well because Mr. Javed Akhtar has highlighted issues relating to the transmission sector. Now, I would request our Honorable Chairman to please come at front for presenting souvenirs and participation certificate to the speakers of NEPRA Energy Week. Thank you. Actually, before I do that, uh, before close of play today, I would uh, like to once again thank you all for participating and uh, especially Javed Saab, you made this highly boring uh, topic so emotional and passionate, you know, and I can feel the energy and uh, despite it's being, uh, you know, it's, it's been many, many hours since we are sitting here and it's very uh, late in the evening, still you have kept everybody awake. And I, uh, you know, congratulate you on that. Secondly, I'm, I'm so grateful because you have really, sorry, you have really, uh, 
you know, given us a lot of uh, enthusiasm because uh, the kind of motivating words that you have used for NAPRA, I assure you this is the first time we are trying to do something like this, but this is going to be a regular feature like our state of industry report is considered to be the most respected uh, report uh, in the industry. You will see this uh, session is going to be considered as the most uh, sought after session uh, in the entire uh, uh, you know, country on power industry. One more thing that uh, I would like to say to you that uh, you are uh, situated in uh, Wabda House on 7th floor and uh, your NTDC friends are on the 4th floor and when you asked me to arrange a meeting between you two to tell you what is going on with the transmission companies, that's a bit surprising for me. <laughs> but I hope you will have a better communication and uh, but I have taken your message very seriously. And I've already asked my guy to actually arrange it uh, uh, within two or three weeks. We are going to arrange a meeting between yourselves and NDDC and make sure that uh, we get not only an update on the project from your side. Uh, last time, I think we had a huge army of people. We just need a couple of, you alone is good enough actually. And we need probably one or two, uh, you know, people who are knowledgeable from NDDC. And we will definitely ask them loud and clear, we, we need an update on the evacuation facilities uh, from all these projects. So I assure you we'll do that. Just keep us posted on your meeting with them and if you need our presence in that meeting, we'll be more than happy. I myself will be more than happy to come and attend. Bahadur Sahib is an expert on uh, uh, especially hurdle generation. I'll be more than happy to send him along or take, uh, bring him along with me or send him in, uh, you know, to represent NAPRA. But we'll assure you that uh, whatever help you need will definitely be there as your partners. One more thing that I would like to tell uh, the, the, the participants and especially my organizers, today's session was excellent. Uh, the only thing I feel that we need to focus more on uh, in the uh, next four days, I'm looking for liquid gold here. I'm looking for some actionable suggestions. You know, everybody who's coming here, they should be focusing on Pakistan's model as to what our challenges are and how can they provide us some solutions to be able to uh, implement them on ground, to be able to improve our efficiencies and remove our inefficiencies to have the most affordable and reliable energy in Pakistan. With this, I thank you everybody and uh, please stay for a few more minutes. We have uh, the prize distribution ceremony. Here uh, we are going to acknowledge uh, the, the contribution of all those who joined us today. So please uh, go ahead. Mr. Shah Jahan Mirza, MD PPIB. Okay. And uh, Mr. Najib Ahmed, Country MD, ABB. Mr. Hassan Ijaz, Marketing Head, ABB. Mr. Wang Bo, CEO PMLTC. Mr. 
Mr. Ottoman Banama, <laughs> Journal Engineering Power Services. And last but not the least, Mr. Javed Akhtar, Member Power Wabda, the most energizing speaker of today's session. Please give it a big hand to Mr. Javed Akhtar. this we end our today's session inshallah we will meet tomorrow thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen thank you for your participation